M friends, tonight we are not building a new model, but it's not a restoration project either. Instead, we'll finish this 148 scale Panzer 38T from Tamiya that was built and painted by my friend. He's the one I refer to as airbrushing guru and master of stowage, showing both qualities perfectly on this model. The smoothness of his airbrushing is something I can only dream about, and the creativity when it comes to stowage is unmatched. Well, at least unmatched by me. The only thing I find not excellent is the tarps, so before I can continue where he left off, I'll slightly improve them. My favorite medium for this job is green stuff. This body is very flexible, like rubber, and you can easily roll it as thin as a sheet of paper. When I talked to him about this, we came to the conclusion that it comes down to lack of practice. After all, my friend spent the last several years focusing on aircraft models, and the only putty he had at hand was magic sculpt. He also prefers painting stowage with an airbrush, while I like brush painting, and for that you need to have the stowage as fluffy and textured as possible. This is still in line with my friend's original vision, but it looks a little bit more in scale, and most importantly, it's gonna be easier to paint. Although it's perfectly okay to paint a raw putty, after all I did that on the Yak Panther once, I wanted to give the pile a coat of primer, mainly because of the resin accessories such as the wooden crates. This, of course, led to some overspray, and while I was fixing that, I noticed something else, something equally interesting as the stowage. My post-shading mixture was different than his. I like to use German grey and white, so I asked him, and as it turns out, he post-shaded the tank with German grey and buff. Good stuff, good stuff. At this point, I also airbrushed some of the hard stowage, mainly the boxes, canteens and so on. With that, I could seal the entire model with flat varnish. Wait, I was going to say that I could now gloss before decals. The kit offers only one marking option, so the only useful thing from that was German crosses. The numbers came from an unknown decal sheet from a dragon kit, and yes, I had to make each one from three decals. Not very good stuff. And now, as I was going to say, I could seal the model with flat varnish. And right after that, I covered the entire tank with two light coats of chipping fluid. The first layer is usually quite uneven because of the surface tension, so two are always a better option if you want to have full control over your chipping. As you probably figured out from the thumbnail and the title of this video, and because it's summer, I'm giving this model a winter whitewash. My initial plan was to go with my friend's vision and finish the tank in a dusty, panzer grey finish, but because I did that in my previous video with the panzer of the lake, and because I've seen quite a few requests for a winter themed project, there wasn't much to think about. Grey tank with the winter camouflage is one of the best color combos after all. I had some trouble spraying the white smoothly, but ultimately I managed to somehow pull it off, and it almost looks like the color profile I made in Photoshop. Next I proceeded to the chipping stage. This is a true blessing because on one hand it's an important part of the winterizing process, but on the other it cleans up the messy airbrushing, so no matter how much you struggle while spraying the white, Chipping usually turns it into a very nice result pretty quickly. It's interesting how I didn't pay much attention to this topic in the past, because I think the only winter scene I did was a 100 scale Stuck 3, so maybe I'll find an excuse for another winter tank with snow and everything. Once the white camo was worn down, I gave the rivets a quick round of air washing with ammo shaders. This technique is basically an airbrushed pin wash, <laughs> hence the name air washing. No matter how much I was trying to avoid it, the numbers had to be filled with a dark color using a triple zero paintbrush. Reference photos show what's most likely red outlined with white, because red in monochrome looks almost black. It was pretty common, but I felt like it would distract from the overall desaturated look of the model, so I went with black. Well, more like very dark grey. With the entire base coat done and dealt with, I quickly proceeded to the next stage, pin washing. 
I was in a bit of a hurry from this point all the way to the finish line because I started pinwashing a few hours before my friend's wedding. Uh, not the one who's made the model, but another one. I know, it's awesome to have more than one friend, right? Well, pinwashes and winter camouflage are something like a match made in heaven because they complement each other perfectly. I chose AK's wash for interiors for its grayish green color and the effect it creates on the winter camouflage is just top tier stuff. The gray parts received a darker wash made from winter streaking grime. I've used these streaking grimes on my last few models, uh, the Beetle, Panzer of the Lake and now this one. The reason? My dedicated washes started deteriorating and I'm too preoccupied to buy new ones. I mean, as long as it works, right? Anyway, you can be even more heavy-handed than this, because there are a couple of steps that will give more life to the winter camo. One of them is picking out small details in a brighter color. This is something I started doing this year and it's one of my favorite tricks. It makes the model look more detailed, bigger and more three-dimensional, almost four-dimensional. So that's the tank with its camouflage applied and outlined. Pinwashing over a flat surface allows us to add some subtle staining and weathering, which is very cool on a winter camo. Let's now focus on the other techniques related to the tank, so we can then paint the stowage. Detail painting usually doesn't come first, but that was the case here. Most of the stuff just has to be painted grey anyway, so <laughs> yeah, but not all of it will remain like that. For example, after painting the spare track links in different shades of grey, I gave them a heavy enamel rust wash. This is a super simple trick that works every time. Paint something in grey, give it a rusty wash, let it dry and you have an authentic, old steel surface. Just like with these jerry can holders, although they'd most likely be painted in panzer grey, I just wanted them to stand out. The large exhaust was treated similarly. I base coated it with a medium grey acrylic paint and flooded the entire surface with pigment jockeys from VMS. These are new enamel products from VMS and I helped them a little with their development, mostly just in the form of constructive feedback and testing the prototypes. Anyway, they dry totally flat and the results are pretty convincing. After spraying the exhaust with chipping fluid, I added a patch of winter camo that would most likely be applied here. Once I chipped it down, I sealed the result with flat varnish and added some staining with winter streaking grime. It's a small but prominent detail for sure. Now we're getting to the real magic of winter camouflages. Mapping is an old school technique most commonly used on winter finishes and it's about applying a very diluted white paint in the form of maps, or you can call it small irregular patches. It adds a lot of visual texture, making the camouflage look as if it was applied hastily with a paintbrush, but also it builds upon those dirt passes we created with pin washes. That's what I was hinting at a few minutes ago, you can add a lot of dirt and then tone the effect down or adjust it to your liking with mapping. In fact, you can add this effect in multiple stages, even as a finishing touch in, of course, limited amounts. The next step is chipping, something I'd usually do as the very first thing because I like to use a sponge and whatnot, right? But in this case, I skipped the light superficial scraping altogether and went right down to the metal with a paintbrush and dark rust from Vallejo. The base coat was pretty light already so the chips would be nicely visible, but also the model had lots of visual texture, so excessive chipping wasn't really necessary. Also, as some of you know, I'm renovating my house and it was somewhere at this point when I realized that I would be moving my studio setup once again. So I was painting the model and preparing a new room for my, hopefully, final workbench and filming studio setup. Anyway, rust effects on top of a winter camouflage can be tricky because they'll easily seep into the flat white paint, completely overpowering its effect. Sure, this can be fixed with another layer of mapping, but it's easier to just avoid most of the white areas. And as a bonus, this way the resulting weathering finish is gonna look more interesting. Sweet, so that's the metal portion of the model mostly finished. Of course, it's missing the earth effects and the running gear, but we'll treat those as soon as we get the stowage out of the way. 
and there's a lot of stowage on this model. But as you'll see, with the right approach, it's not too overwhelming. The most important step is the first step, painting everything with black-brown. It gives you a clean, dark base coat, something similar to priming the entire model black and then post-shading the paint job. Once that is done, I like to focus on the hard parts. Crates, ammo cans, canteens, mess kits, you name it. Everything that's not soft and fluffy. That's because these details can be painted using standard armor weathering techniques such as washes, chipping and rust effects. And if there's something I don't like, it's rusty enamel seeping into meticulously painted tarps. So these are pretty easy and we already get a good portion of the stowage out of the way, right? Then we have details that are somewhere in between hard and soft stowage, such as canteens where the techniques are still pretty basic, but we can already employ some light shading. Also, these leather straps are not very detailed, so sculpting with a paintbrush, aka painting details that are not even there, is essential. Painting the tarps isn't that difficult technique-wise. It's all about using the dark base coat to its fullest potential, so the first layer of the actual paint has to be very translucent. This, in fact, is the most time-consuming part of the process, because you need to build the opacity on the visible parts, while keeping the dark undercoat visible in the shadowed areas, all the while trying to avoid too many visible brush marks. Once you've got that established, it's just about adding continuously lighter paints in smaller and smaller quantities, of course focusing on the most visible and raised portions of the tarp. That's why making it as fluffy as possible with lots of folds is so important, otherwise you just wouldn't have anything to paint. In fact, the most difficult part for me is figuring out the color palette. So the tarps don't look all the same, yet at the same time they're not too different, because the result would look very comic book-like. And if you don't like the result, you can just repaint the tarp with black brown and start all over again, which was my case with the one next to the turret. Ultimately, I used olive drab, Russian uniform, field grey, US field drab and US dark green, all highlighted with Iraqi sand. Okay, and now for the weathering. I wanted to achieve something simple, quick, yet effective. Mainly because the model was already interesting enough, but also because I didn't have much time to get super involved with the mud effects. So the first layer was the usual AK acrylic paste intended for dioramas. I also brushed this product on the Lincoln length tracks and while it was still wet, I wiped it off the contact points. The next step was pre-dusting. Using a similar approach to my AMX50, I didn't spray over the entire mud layer, I just created a smooth color transition between the dark mud and the clean walls of the lower hull. It's a very good foundation for weathering, so while I had the diluted paint in my airbrush, I sprayed some of it on the upper hull as well. Choosing the right earth tones is very important on a winter tank, because you don't want to subtract from the cold, gloomy winter look, so I always go for desaturated tones. But on Panzer Grey, it gets a little tricky, because you need to also have some contrast between the cold grey and a slightly warmer dust color. So ultimately, to keep it short, buff from Tamiya is a perfect choice. Already knowing that most of the lower hull will be invisible, I added only the most basic effects using enamels. Once again, proper color choice is important. Rainmark's effects are very desaturated and thus work perfectly with this color palette. Applying the effect with speckling and then dragging it down with a flat paintbrush is a quick way of achieving visual texture without spending, you know, several hours on it. Dark tones were added with earth, that's the actual name of the color. When you think about it, the entire process is about using the previous layers to our advantage. The pre-dusting was improved with speckling and blending of the Rainmarks effect, while the still visible dark texture paste was improved with a heavy wash of earth. Of course blended with enamel thinner so it would nicely melt into the dry earth tone. The tracks were painted in the same manner, but here I had to paint the polished parts with silver. Here I'd like to give a shout out to the silver paint from AK's third generation range of acrylics. I haven't tried many metallic paints in the past, but this might be the first one that doesn't have those suspended metallic sparkles in it, you know, and it truly looks authentic. Finishing touches are easier to apply with the running gear assembled. 
I would probably glue the entire thing together, just like I did on my T55 from Tamiya in the same scale, but my friend likes to keep the wheels and the lower hull separate. It's not a big deal, it's also a good option, but I personally am not a fan of forcibly gluing things together when the model is pretty much finished. So the running gear now gives us a better idea about the overall look of the model, what's missing, where it's missing and so on. Using it as a visual aid, I added small amounts of earth on the upper hull, mostly on the mudguards, into corners and also blending it as a form of, I don't know, like fake shadows, you know, post shading with earth tones, that kind of deal. Again, winter camouflages are ideal for these subtle effects because anything you add is gonna be nicely visible there. Heavier mud effects usually require more depth, so I went over some areas with winter streaking grime. Making a winter tank muddy is probably the easiest way to achieve a nice interesting finish because of the strong contrast between white and mud, and although I initially wanted to add some snow, there just wasn't time for that on this project. So I wrapped it up with some final small details such as the antenna made from 0.2mm wire painted grey and some very limited smoke residue on the exhaust pipe. Okay, my friends, so my friend's model is finished, but not entirely. He's been telling me that he would love to have a scenic base from me in his collection, and because we all love scenic bases here, that's what I'm gonna do in the next video. I'll definitely add snow on the ground, don't worry about that, although I'm not sure about figures. You probably noticed at the start of the video that I assembled the plastic figure from the kit because it looks reasonably detailed, but again, I wasn't overly excited about it, but we'll see, I might give it a try. To sum it up, I painted this model in 5 days, and maybe the result isn't stellar, but it's a good exercise in efficiency, focusing on what's most important and giving those aspects your best effort. Also, stowage is always a good excuse to practice your shading with a paintbrush, and it was extra fun on this model because my friend never holds back when it comes to adding stowage. Anyway, I'll be moving my studio to another room very soon, and hopefully I'll be finally able to set everything up for maximum filming efficiency, because, for example, when it comes to these final 360 shots, I have to clean my entire workbench, put a large PVC background on the wall, film the model, put the background down and set the workbench up again. And that's not a lot of fun, as you can probably imagine. <laughs> anyway, anyway, thank you for watching, my friends, and thank you to my awesome patrons who make this show possible. If you like what I'm doing, want to get more of it, and in return support my work, you can go to my Patreon page and see what kind of rewards would you like. I'm posting there almost every day with updates from my workbench, we can get in touch through DMs, comments and emails. I'm posting one week early ad-free videos so you could watch the next one right now. I also have some small 3D models for detailing your models and dioramas, a bunch of references from the real world if you need inspiration for old buildings, landscapes and so on, and also these beautiful studio photos which you can download in full resolution. Anyway, m dear friends, I need to figure out a simple yet interesting vignette for this model and hopefully I'll be able to surprise my friend with the finished piece and, if luck is on my side, catch some of our conversation about the final result on video. And you all stay safe, stay awesome, build your models, don't just collect them and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers!